The proceeding will start shortly. Good morning, all, and thank you for joining today, particularly all our witnesses. Thank you indeed for helping us with this important inquiry. Uh, we want to learn from you by the long-term consequences of people who, get, who suffer from COVID. So if you don't mind, if, are you happy to go in the order of your short presentation? Dr. Babu Narayan, followed by Professor Chris Breitling, followed by Professor Kamlesh Kunti. It's nice to see you, Kamlesh. I trained him once. Thank you very much. Would you like to go first, Dr. Babu Narayan? Thank you for the invitation to give evidence to you today. So cardiovascular disease um, is at the center of this COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm going to outline three main reasons why this is the case. First, people with cardiovascular conditions are at increased risk of COVID-19 related death. It's clear that heart and circulatory disease and its risk factors, diabetes, hypertension, and obesity are key determinants for risk of severe COVID-19 illness or death. Diabetes more than doubles the risk of death from COVID-19. Repeated studies demonstrate hypertension is linked to worse COVID-19 illness and outcome. Morbid obesity doubles the risk of death and being overweight with a BMI of 30 to 35 increases risk of death by 27%. Second, there are indirect effects of the pandemic that are putting people with cardiovascular conditions at increased risk. Some of this is illness behavior we have seen very clearly that fewer people sought emergency treatment for heart attack or stroke because of fear of coronavirus infection or not wanting to be a burden on the NHS. For example, in, for example, in March, there was a 50% drop in emergency department attendances for myocardial ischemia, which is symptoms that could be um, linked to a heart attack. Similarly, during lockdown, there was a 66% 60, reduction in heart failure admissions, also an urgent um, treatment requiring thing. We know in London at the end of March and in April, the, um, there was a reduction in 38% in attendance in hospital for the most severe kind of heart attack, recognizable by its electrocardiogram in the ambulance and requiring paramedics to take the patient direct to the cardiac department for immediate procedure. So these reductions in heart attack attendance and stroke presentation and heart failure admission started at the time of the first cases of COVID-19 in the UK and before full lockdown, implying these effects are behavioural, not just a true change in prevalence. The second type of indirect effect is the reduced availability of elective cardiovascular care and waiting lists are indeed getting longer. So as an example, waiting lists at the end of July show that there are more than 180,000 people waiting for investigations or treatment in cardiology or cardiothoracic surgery. Another example, we know that investigations with diagnostic imaging are the gateway to appropriate treatment, and these services have fallen markedly. For example, there was a 67% reduction in echocardiogram ultrasound of the heart availability in April and May this year. But you might want to ask, has that lack of health care caused harm, is it, or is this productivity and efficiency? Well, we are seeing the tragic effect of COVID-19 and statistics related to deaths. Whilst COVID-19 explained 80% of the excess mortality we have seen during the peak of the pandemic, it does not explain all. And it does seem that some of this excess mortality is driven by patients with heart and circulatory conditions. During the peak of the pandemic, in just one week, there were more than 700 excess deaths from heart and circulatory diseases, including around 300 from coronary heart disease, and nearly 200 from stroke. Across the whole of the pandemic, there have been 3,600 excess deaths from heart and circulatory diseases. This raises concern that perceived or real barriers in access to care potentially caused avoidable harm, and this should not be repeated. These indirect effects need to be monitored and mitigated, and we need to restore and maintain vital heart services. Third, Severe COVID-19 infection affects the circulation and the heart. There is emerging evidence that points to a direct impact of COVID-19 on the blood vessels and the heart. Severe COVID-19, the type that admits you to a hospital is clotty. And this seems to be related to damage to the function of the endothelium, the single layer lining of the blood vessels throughout the body, which appears culprit. 
If a clot occurs in the brain, this will result in stroke or other neurological deficit and including affecting younger people. If it's in a coronary artery supplying the heart, this will look like a heart attack because blood supply is blocked to the heart muscle, causing potentially long-term damage. Clots in microvessels and can cause lung and kidney damage. And we have learned during the course of the pandemic that we need to thin the blood for severe COVID-19 illness to try to mitigate this. In severe COVID-19, whole body inflammation can affect the heart. This is demonstrated through measuring heart muscle damage markers in blood, which when present signify heart tissue injury and predict worse outcome, regardless of whether there is underlying heart disease before the COVID-19 illness. Myocarditis, stress cardiomyopathy and arrhythmia, as well as palpitations during recovery have all also been described. When we look at COVID-19 patients who have severe illness in hospital with echocardiography, there is a reduction in heart pumping function in some including severe reduction in heart function. We need to dissect the mechanisms of how and why the heart is affected as a vital next step, next step given several mechanisms of heart injury are being described. So in summary for now, heart and circulatory patients are being dealt a double blow. They're at high risk of death from SARS-CoV-2 infection and COVID-19 illness, but also of dying in excess of expected numbers from their heart and circulatory disease unrelated directly to COVID-19. The reduced availability of heart services that may also need to additionally address heart care for patients with newly diagnosed heart disease post COVID-19 could result in significant morbidity and mortality at risk of exceeding that due to COVID-19 directly. This would be a catastrophe given cardiology care has amongst the strongest evidence base and we know how to successfully treat these conditions. Health inequalities are also being exacerbated and we know cardiovascular disease is an important contributor to the deprivation gap. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kundi. Yeah, can I ask Professor Brightley, please? Lord Patel and uh, colleagues, thank you for inviting me to, to present today. So I'm a respiratory physician, so I specialize in lung disease and I lead the COVID-19 acute and follow-up uh, research in Leicester, particularly focused on lung disease, but also beyond the lungs. I'm also the science lead for our European professional society, the European Respiratory Society, which is also leading follow-up and impacts on people with pre-morbid lung disease. So the infection COVID-19 obviously is a respiratory infection, and I think Although many of us were fearful of what was coming, having seen what was in Wuhan and then clearly in Italy, I think we still were surprised by the scale of the impact in, in the UK. And clearly this leads to admission into hospital in the uh, early stages, and as high as 20% of people with the mortality figures in the region of about uh, also 20 to 25% of, of admissions. So it then causes, as you will be familiar, a severe pneumonia uh, in those that are admitted. So in, in people who are not admitted, it's largely an upper respiratory infection. For those who are admitted into hospital with respiratory failure, it's, it's almost entirely a consequence of then a pneumonia, so a, a lung infection. What we find is that there's a very broad inflammatory response. I completely agree with Dr. Babu. Nairan, that this is beyond the lung. So it affects the stickiness of the blood and then it leads to end organ damage beyond the lungs. We know in the lungs themselves that there is also scarring as well as pneumonia and the acute scarring can occur in approximately 30% of individuals at the time of the event. As part of the national COVID follow-up study called FOSCOVID, which I lead, we've then started to, to look at what, what are these impacts longer term. We've got some early clues from studies in Italy and China, and this suggests that even when you're looking at people who've been hospitalized two to three months later after discharge, then only about 10 to 15 percent of people have no persistent symptoms. So over 80% of people have symptoms, and these include fatigue, breathlessness, chronic pain. 
And in those that are breathless, so the ones that are affecting largely their, their, their lungs and also their cardiovascular system, it's then over 45% of those patients. We started looking at imaging, so we're doing whole body MR scans. So we're looking at the brain and all of the organs. And we've now got pilot data from the first uh, 50 patients, which is then showing end organ damage in, in kidneys, in the liver, in the lungs, and in the heart, and, and less so uh, in the brain. And this is affecting over a third of the individuals at, at the sort of two, two month point. So we're really getting a lot of clues that there are things that are happening across multiple organs from a disease that initially starts as a respiratory infection. We then are starting to learn about treatments that can then modify the effects. So treatments that were given acutely that you'll be familiar with, such as in the recovery study with dexamethasone, we're now going to be able to look at whether those benefits that were seen in the acute phase also then modify the trajectory of recovery. Most of the research to date has been focused in patients who were hospitalized and people who were then discharged from hospital. But we are all familiar with friends and family that have, have had a COVID-19 infection in the community that didn't lead to admission into hospital. And many of these people also have ongoing problems. And there are plans for long-term follow-up studies for people who have community infection. Some of those may have also had pneumonia and not ended up in hospital, but many may have uh, this more broader inflammatory effect that may then affect many, many organs in the body. So in the studies that we're doing, we're also then trying to understand are there things that we can then change, not just necessarily for the individuals that are affected, but also people who might then be part of any future wave where we can then modify interventions acutely and also modify uh, interventions in the follow-up phase. So this is the response, the direct response to, to COVID-19 itself. But as already been said by my uh, colleague ahead of me was that there's also then an indirect impact on people with pre-morbid conditions, which we don't yet really fully understand how COVID affects pre-morbid conditions. And we also certainly don't have a full understanding on the impact on the services that are going to happen over the winter months. We are already familiar with how COVID has consumed our uh, lives in many, many ways and has then consumed healthcare resources away from routine care. And this is likely to become a problem that's compounded in the forthcoming winter with other winter infections and other pressures on, on both the community and acute care which is gonna be even more problematic with uh, any potential future waves over the winter. So I shall finish there really with just summarizing that of course, as a respiratory physician, I'll highlight that there's a, this is a respiratory disease and there's an impact on the lung, but I am very mindful that this is a multi-organ impact, which also then goes beyond typical uh, medical responses, but also includes an impact on mental health which we need to then acknowledge and then manage for those who have been affected by COVID-19 and all of the collateral damage in the healthcare system and the economy that is consequent on COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Can I now ask Professor Kunti. Kamlesh, would you? Um, uh, Lord Patel, uh, colleagues, uh, thank you for giving us uh, this invitation to present today. Um, my remit is to talk about the disproportionate impact that COVID-19 has had on Black and minority ethnic health populations. Myself and uh, a colleague of mine, Wazim Hanif, highlighted this for the first time, I think globally, on the 4th of April on a tweet, because we'd seen a lot of patients coming into intensive care unit. And then following this, the uh, ICNARC data, the Intensive Care National Audit Research Center data came out the following week, which showed that overall, um, about 33% of people admitted to intensive care unit were of non-white ethnicity when we know the overall population of UK is about 14% being on non-white. The largest inequalities affected uh, in terms of the evidence are by age, sex and deprivation. And we know that more people from black minority ethnic populations reside in deprived areas. Um, if we look uh, on average, when uh, there's a number of studies, uh, Blacks and South Asians have about a 40 to 70% increased risk after we adjust for other factors in terms of both hospitalization 
and in terms of severe outcomes such as mortality. And we and others have looked at the literature uh, and have tried to explain the disproportionate impact in ethnic minorities uh, by differential exposures and increased vulnerability. And they can be categorized into structural, biological, and behavioral reasons. The structural inequalities are systematic disadvantages uh, such as uh, structural discrimination, uh, which could be in social structures, housing, income, occupation, healthcare, education. Biological uh, differences, um, we know from studies that have been done by us and many others, and uh, Sir Babu Naran also mentioned that cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes, hypertension are the reported, uh, frequently reported comorbidities associated with adverse outcomes in COVID-19. And we know that these are more highly prevalent in ethnic minority populations. There are also behavioral reasons, and there are some uh, data coming that there may be poor understanding for the, for the need for social distancing, low adherence to social distancing, and lack of understanding in terms of social isolation when symptomatic or when a family member is symptomatic. And this may be due to, and there's been some evidence for this from a report showing that there are lack of culturally appropriated and targeted public health messaging that may have contributed to this. There are other additional plausible behavioral factors such as uh, poor lifestyle, physical activity we know is poor and it is associated with, with, uh, with severe COVID. Uh, and we and many others have uh, given uh, uh, potential actions for, for the short term, medium term and long term, um, mainly around the culturally tailoring of public health messaging, uh, tailored test trace, isolated strategies, priority of testing certain uh, ethnic minority workers, uh, giving specific uh, recommendations for employers, religious festivals, religious schools, funerals, burials and weddings. But in summary, it's clear that a comprehensive multi-sectorial approach supported by strong policy action is needed to tackle the multiple and complex structural, biological and behavioral reasons driving the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 in ethnic minority communities. These recommendations are key to reducing the further uh, health inequalities uh, which we may see related to COVID-19. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you to all three of you for your excellent presentation. What we're going to do now is I'm going to ask my colleagues in turn to have some questions for you uh, that depending upon which specialty it is, feel free to pick up and anybody or any of the other witnesses want to join in, please do so. So, Baroness Blackwood. Thank you very much, Lord Chair. Um, I'd like to try and understand the scale of challenge that we may be facing with long COVID. And I realise it's very early days. Um, for us to get a sense of that. But nevertheless, it would be helpful to get your best understanding as witnesses who have been um, working in this field as to um, where we may be headed. So Professor Breitling, if I could start with you, given the work that you've been doing. Um, do you, you gave us some very stark statistics on those who have come out of, of hospital and are still um, struggling with um, long-term um, health conditions. Do, do you think that patients um, with mild um, or um, severe cases are more likely to be suffering? And, and what do you think is, is the scale of those who come out, the percentage of those who come out um, who are likely to have ongoing cases? Thanks very much for the, for the question. One of the things I think is important as a distinction is the people who ended up in hospital had respiratory failure. And that was the main reason for them going in. Sometimes it was also for other, for other social reasons and, and difficulty in maintaining at home, but largely it was respiratory failure. So those, so those people are more likely to be the ones that will then also develop long-term consequences in terms of lung damage and are probably more likely to have some of the more severe inflammatory consequences in other organs. Notwithstanding that, the people who also had disease in the community are, are likely to have some of the other uh, long-term consequences, such as the fatigue, chronic pain, impacts on cognition, impacts on mental health, although they may be less likely to have conditions such as long-term breathlessness. And one of the difficulties there is, is also how does that, um, how do those changes then impact that individual? So if you can now no longer 
uh, perform in the level that you were before. You may not be able to then undertake your job. You may not be able to continue to study, look after members of the family. Then relatively modest changes may actually have large impacts. The other thing that we don't yet understand, and this is the thing I'm most concerned about, is trajectories. So the data I've been describing is very much the follow-up data from individuals that have been seen in, in hospital. And we also then have some follow-up data based on uh, apps such as the Zoe app where people have been recording their symptoms. And what we really don't know is we don't know whether some of these conditions actually develop. So there may be subgroups of people who actually become worse over time. And that, that definitely would be a, a concern within those people who are in the community. So if there was early renal damage, for example, that may not be overt, that could then lead into long-term problems. If there was onset of new diabetes, there may be impacts on the heart that then again haven't necessarily manifested themselves immediately as symptoms, but might then progress over, over time. So I think there's the acute subacute over the next few months and then there's this longer term trajectory that we really don't know and we really won't know until we sort of follow people up for a year and a year and longer and, and so far have have you um or any of the other witnesses been able to establish whether these long covid symptoms th these these lingering symptoms are are sort of driven by sort of ongoing virus or they are a factor of with side effects really I suppose of the really intense treatments that you might have through um, severe, having a severe um, respiratory sort of um, uh, condition or um, other organ failure, intubation, ICU sedation, whatever it may be. All right, so perhaps my answer first, and I'm sure my, my colleagues will, will have uh, something to add. So there's, again, it's slightly different depending upon where you where you've had care. So to, to answer your very first question, do I think this is persistent virus? I think the answer will be no. So there's no there's no suggestion that people are having a chronic uh, viral illness. This seems to be very much a response from the from the host, so from the patient. And then the second question then is about do treatments have an impact? Well, if you've been in hospital, especially, then you may have been on a ventilator and intensive care or even onto what we call ECMO and in both of those cases then the treatment itself can also cause uh, damage to the airways and can also lead to organ damage to affect many other systems. Being in hospital itself, many of you I'm sure have been in hospital at some time, itself uh, is leads to problems in terms of deconditioning, it takes a long time to recover, there's also then impacts in terms of anxiety around uh, acute illness episodes. So I think that all of those are really important. Okay, in people that are in the community, then they're not going to have the same impacts in terms of the treatment impact, but they are still they're still definitely going to have impacts on. Uh, I mean, many of us were concerned about our own health and our loved ones in terms of who was going to catch COVID. So there was a huge, uh, quite understandable fear, which is still there. And I think that will then lead as an enormous impact on people's mental health at the same time as they're then going to have physical impacts from, from the virus itself. Perhaps okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to request both questions and answers to be short, please. I know there's a wealth of information we can learn from, but otherwise I won't get through in time. Baroness Blackwood, have you? Um, we can move on. I've taken your your, your um, strictures on board. Okay. I'm Lord sorry Judge. about that. I'm very sorry <laughs> both to both uh, our witnesses and you. Lord Boric, and if you don't have questions, my colleagues, uh, my lords, then don't worry, I'll just move on to the next one. Lord Boric. Thank you. Um, a question for Dr. Babu and Marianne. It, the, at the beginning of all this, way back when, we, we'd, as uh, Professor Breitling said, we thought it was a respiratory uh, uh, disease, uh, and it slowly became more complicated. And one of the things that happened was that the Brompton Hospital became a specialised COVID um, centre, 
Was that the right decision to make a hospital to concentrate on the one disease and to get rid of your pediatric uh, cardiology and the other sections that the Brompton is so famous for? Um, good morning. <laughs> um, I'll answer that question as best I can. As um, you will know, I do also work as a cardiologist at the Royal Brompton Hospital, and indeed my subspecialty within cardiology is congenital heart disease, and particularly people who've grown up from their congenital heart disease and are now adults. Um, I think there's two things. There was clearly a need to treat people with COVID-19 illness, including severe illness, and there was an aspect of care hospitals like the Brompton could deliver that other people might not have been in as easy a position to deliver well. For example, the kind of support for people with very, very sick COVID-19 illness that require um, ECMO, which um, the Royal Brompton, St Thomas's, um, Leicester, other regions in the UK are specialists in. Having said that, going forward, I think we need to consider very carefully cardiology patients who have subspecialty needs. For congenital heart disease, paediatric and adult, there are only 11 centres, which are surgical centres in the UK, and that have the imaging to procedure expertise to see congenital heart disease patients. Much of that specialty is a surveillance specialty, so we don't necessarily wait until patients are sick with breathlessness. Um, they don't really get chest pain or we don't wait always for important arrhythmia. Some of the care is done based on imaging having shown change and showing that there's an optimal timing for a procedure or an intervention. So these patients have not been seen. Um, and you asked specifically about pediatrics. Um, care has been delivered safely because hospitals have worked collaboratively with each other to make sure all children and adults who need urgent care can get a place in hospital. But as I've alluded to in the broader picture, there is certainly a need going forward to now, I think, protect and maintain core cardiovascular services. We cannot catch up. We aren't even back to normal volume at the moment, and we will not be able to catch up with the backlog. And I think that could be worse and more, um, and more difficult to decide about for subspecialty conditions like inherited cardiomyopathy, congenital heart disease, um, and so on, where there are fewer places with the correct expertise for all patients. Does that answer your question sufficiently? Very much. Pretty much. But the, the, the heart's disease that is developing as part of the long COVID syndrome, <laughs> is that going to be as uh, uh, treated in the same way as when those uh, syndromes like... Um, uh, uh, other forms of heart uh, disease, uh, uh, will we, would it be treated in the same way or, or is it a different form of uh, heart failure? I think that's an excellent question. Um, so when we think of one of the types of um, mechanism of heart disease that we talked about sticky blood and clotting um, affecting the vessels supplying the blood with oxygen, oxygenated blood or the microvessels, um, we have Test, we have treatments for that. We might not yet know exactly which patient should have an antiplatelet, at which point which patient should have full anticoagulation. But generally, we've learned during the pandemic that patients need blood thinning and there are available treatments. We still need to learn, and others may want to comment on that, how long people should continue that treatment when they go home from hospital, for example. If we see heart dysfunction, so heart pumping, the heart doesn't pump as well. We do have tried and tested medications for heart failure. So in answer to your question, broadly, we understand which drugs to use to support people through these complications, but there will be an increased burden of care if we are diagnosing more and more people with cardiac disease um, after their COVID-19 illness. Thank you very much. We've lost our chairman. <laughs> you haven't, Lord Brown. In fact, uh, thank you, Lord Chair. So, as I, as I told you yesterday, I had two questions in mind, but in the interest of uh, time, I'll ask one question. I'll expand it slightly so that it engages all of our witnesses. So this question um, initially is directed to Professor Breitling, and, and it, it's an opportunity for him, I think, to expand a bit about the FOSS COVID study, which he's already referred to in his opening remarks. So the study which you lead, Professor, is a substantial undertaking and it has attracted a significant proportion of the available funding. 
and you plan, as far as I understand this, to study the experience of thousands of recovering with 19 patients, perhaps tens of thousands over time. So the question is, how do you plan to ensure that at this scale, it won't just become a large bureaucratic exercise and that the data collected uh, will rather lead to improved clinical outcomes for recovering patients? And how quickly do you think that can be uh, achieved? And I'll just expand this slightly. So specifically, will it study and engage the issue of excess mortality, which is referred to by Dr. Babinarayan in her opening remarks? And the disproportionate effect of COVID-19 on the BME population is referred to by Professor Kunti. Who would like to start? Uh, maybe, you know, maybe, yes, Professor Backling. I'll try and answer it as briefly as I can. So FOSS-COVID is uh, 8.5 million funding from, from UKRI. It will recruit 10,000 individuals of which we then have 4,000 of those which will have a detailed follow-up over a year uh, requiring additional bioresource and 6,000 that will be then looking at their clinical data. We'll be already looking at the interventions that are given during the acute stage to see whether they change trajectory in order to then modify uh, the use of interventions acutely for any future wave. We've also already embedded and repurposed other clinical trials. So one of the topics that's come up that's, that's very important is then the stickiness of the blood and thinking about risk of clots. And we have a study which is then funded by NIHR HTA, which we then repurposed to then link into FOSS COVID for early interventions in patients who have pulmonary emboli uh, as a consequence of COVID-19. So it's not just an ambition that we'll be able to actually go from beyond collecting data to actually making a change. It's actually something that we've already realized within the first few weeks of the study. And I, I completely agree with Lord Brown that that's really important. We've engaged very widely across uh, the whole academic community. So we have working groups in all of the disease areas, including then a very close partnership with the BHF and IHR partnership for heart disease, and then linked into two of the flagship studies within that, one called Seymour, looking at the whole body MRI scanning that I've described, and the second called COVID heart. And uh, we'll certainly be linking into others. So it's something that I think is really important that although I'm a respiratory physician, this is a disease that doesn't, uh, doesn't understand boundaries of, of organs, it affects the whole body. In terms of the BAME uh, question, then my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Kamlesh Kunti, we're in the same institution. There is a working group uh, looking across all of the different disease areas to then reflect on the impact of ethnicity. And we're, and we're also seeking additional funding from UKRI for bringing together further work within FOSS-COVID, but then linking this ethnicity question beyond FOSS-COVID to uh, studies within the community and also birth cohort studies. So it's certainly something we're very, very cognizant of. Dr. Brown. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. I, I, I see Professor Quimpy indicated he wants to make a contribution. Cambridge. Just a quick uh, comment. In, in terms of FOSCO, this will be the, one of the largest studies uh, to be done prospectively. Uh, what we know so far from long COVID is the largest study we've seen is from Italy. It's a couple hundred patients. Another one's that's just come out, another couple hundred patients. And the longest follow-up is up to 60 days. So most of them are very short. This will be uh, over a year with a multi-ethnic population, which we haven't seen in other studies uh, described as yet. Thank you. Lord Brown, you're done? Well, I just want to invite Dr. Babu Narayan to make any comment that she wishes to in this context. I don't intend to ask a further supplementary question. Um, uh, it was mentioned, I'm Associate Medical Director of the British Heart Foundation, and that was mentioned in context of COVID, which Professor Breitling leads. There is a sub-study um, which you mentioned to call FOSS COVID-19 heart. And we mentioned before many mechanisms that we still need to understand better of heart dysfunction that is identified at the time of severe hospital COVID-19 illness. This study will elucidate that um, with more than 300 patients will be studied with MRI 
um, with six month interval follow up to see what resolves. Many, one of the fundamental questions is what is a medium or long term effect? We know that we may be able to identify effects acutely and they may help our management, but we now need to understand what might be medium or long term effects for the future. I think it's a great example of how the cardiovascular community in the UK have been galvanized, worked collaboratively together and worked with this core um, eight and a half million funding to make sure that all the questions can be efficiently answered um, that we have that relate to all kinds of consequences of COVID-19. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, uh, Bernice Hilton. Yes, so I'm interested in the long-term consequences of air pollution on, on people's symptoms. Is it possible, do you think, to tease out air pollution from other factors of social deprivation and social um, consequences of living with large numbers of families and so on? Or is air pollution something that you can sort out from other factors? I think Professor so, Breitling perhaps might start on that one. So, so, so the question is the effect of air pollution on people who have had COVID infections. Professor by Breitling. That's a great question. I mean, we know that reducing air pollution is clearly a good thing with over 4 million deaths worldwide attributed to air pollution, 8% of deaths due to particulates, and over 90% of the world's population are actually living in environments where the levels of pollution are above uh, WHO recommended levels. What, would, what we've done is we've also linked in with, um, there's, a, there's a network of environmental health centres and a Hansel colleague of mine in Leicester leads a, a national centre for which they are able to then map the pollution exposure on a postcode basis. We have permission on the basis of the ethics to then be able to recall pollution exposure. We can do this retrospectively as well as prospectively. So we can look at the uh, pollution on an individual level for all of the 10,000 patients with follow-up at the time of the acute infection, their burden of pollution exposure over time, and then how that also then impacts the trajectory of the disease. And then we're linking into control data from, from other studies. So I think we will be able to unpick this. Uh, I think clearly we should be driving pollution levels down for a multitude of, of uh, health reasons and climate reasons. But it also, I'm sure there'll be data that will emerge to show a impact on COVID-19. Thank you very much. Okay, look, Baroness Hilton, you done? Baroness Hilton, do you want to come back or are you fine? No, thank you very much indeed. Okay, Lord Hollick. Yeah, thank Lord you, Lord Chairman. Um, you, there's widespread expectation that the, there's going to be a significant rise over the winter months, and Professor Brighton referred to that today, a, a, a rise in COVID cases, but actually complications with influenza and the like. We've talked about changes that can be made. What changes can be made in the next three months that will help to deal with this expected surge in cases? Uh, is there a pneumonia vaccination, for instance, should that be ramped up? Um, Professor Hunty talked about messaging to the ethnic communities. What steps do the witnesses think that should be deployed in order to cope with this coming surge? Professor Kunti, do you want to go first? Yes, I mean, what, what we can do um, currently is the simple things. I think we need a really, really tight, robust, find, test, trace, isolate and support programme which isn't working properly in all regions. Um, we've learned a lot from our Leicester lockdown. As you know, we still haven't come out of the lockdown yet, um, but it wasn't, it was, a, it was a centralized scheme that wasn't working. We've gone more localized now, and it has to be locally driven uh, system where we know the populations, we know the, the, the key people, the faith groups, the cultural people, the uh, um, business people who can drive the messaging in the right culturally appropriate format. It doesn't seem that we're going to get a vaccine uh, on this side of Christmas. So I think what we need to do is all the evidence that we have, the, the fine test trace isolate support program, and also the messaging to go in the most culturally appropriate manner. Professor Brightley. So I agree that the public health 
uh, impact is going to be the, 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 the most important, ensuring that we have social distancing, ensuring that we wear masks, ensuring that we then wash our hands. For people who are at uh, greatest risk, and we now have very, very clear understanding of who the at-risk groups are, to try and then minimise their exposure, consider different strategies to, to try and ensure shielding. And then when it comes to hospital care, we've, we have now got improved care. If you now are admitted into hospital with COVID-19, your risk of death is reduced by about a third compared to if you were admitted in March. So we have made great strides and uh, many of those will go forwards. We also need to then have a, from a hospital perspective where I work, you need to have a motivated workforce. I think one of the things that's been really challenging is that people have been working flat out since the beginning of the pandemic and there's not really been any respite. And what's going to happen is there's going to be the usual winter press pressures in hospital in addition to COVID-19. So thinking about how you maintain the, the normal services, keep those away from the acute services, protect individuals to be able to then deliver the acute service that will be required over the winter. And I think this is something that really requires far more action now than is currently being done. And I think that will be, be a really important uh, additional, additional way of beating COVID over the winter. Dr. Babu Narayan. So I mentioned at the beginning that we have um, quite clear data about the um, population risk of heart and circulatory disease being associated as, with severe COVID-19 illness and death. But these population data are not necessarily helpful to individuals at risk. How much heart disease, how se which heart disease, how severe your heart disease, how well controlled it, it is at the moment. So we really need to um, encourage and move forward towards more um, applicable individualized risk assessments. And we're, we at BHF are very supportive of the work in Oxford by Professor Julia Hippesley Cox towards that exactly. Um, going forward, patients need clarity about which things they should not delay so that the health service can protect them rather than them protecting the health service. Um, they need to know about which symptoms or changing symptoms are red flags, meaning they should seek medical advice, but also call up if their care has been postponed. And we need very clear messaging for that. These heart and circulatory patients, the ones I know about, mustn't stay at home for fear of putting pressure on the NHS, um, because indeed delaying their care may actually exacerbate pressures later down the line. They need confidence that the healthcare system is in a good place to treat them safely. With regards that we all, all around the country, need reliable, quick point of care COVID testing so that we can move through the non COVID 19 patients um, whilst at the same time um, hospitals caring for COVID 19. Um, if we're having a surge, resurgence, second wave, we need to ensure that it's medically advised what is core medical care, what is minimum medical care for each specialty, including cardiovascular. Many patients, albeit not all, are gaining from the kind of very abrupt transformation that we've seen in healthcare services. My clinic is on the telephone or a virtual clinic. Um, it, there's a, a good improvement in coordinating investigations to minimize the number of times you have to come to hospital as a patient. That's good for both patients and doctors, but not everything can be done remotely. I can't do my MRI scan remotely or the cardiac CT or the echocardiogram. These are fundamental to managing the care of my patients, let alone doing procedures that save lives and prevent disability. Elective care can very quickly become urgent. It's not only emergency care we need to worry about. So I think we will need to protect cardiac critical care, pediatric and adult, and regional cardiology specialist services. This will avoid a buildup of care that we just can't catch up. And most importantly for the population, prevent avoidable death and disability. I agree about the point made by Professor Brightling about the importance of somehow looking after nurturing our workforce who've been through a lot already. I think we need to, I don't have the solution, but we need to do something about people who are minority ethnic in the UK. Um, there is a cardiology example recently, NICOR published data on 10th September, and it's very concerning to see that people whose um, ethnic background is um, non-white have had different care pathways have had delayed care um, and in a worse fashion to the disparity that exists normally. So I think we need solutions for that. That these features are happening beyond correction for age, deprivation and cardiovascular disease, which we know is 
more common um, in certain ethnic minorities. Is there sufficient? Is there sufficient capacity within the uh, health service to uh, make substantial progress in catching up with those um, elective surgeries that should be done and would be better done now rather than waiting to the next year? I think one of the limitations at the moment is the social distancing. So the way we have to deliver safe care and things like patients having to be tested as COVID negative before they can be admitted for procedures. So that's why I mentioned speeding that up. Um, there have been creative ways of working. Um, I have seen NHS patients as a cardiologist during the pandemic that are more Brompton patients at a private centre so that they don't get delayed. Um, and we may have to see going forward how creative we can be. If COVID-19, which now many, many people know how to treat, could be consolidated, maybe some of the rest of the work can also continue. Um, as you hear very clearly, I'm very worried about excess deaths that could have been avoidable because of tried and tested treatments. Patients we know how to treat and know how to treat well with good outcome. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much. I don't know if Lord Keka has been able to join, but if he hasn't, can I move on to Lord Mayor, please? Uh, Lord Chairman, I'm here. Oh, you are here. Good. Yeah. Good. Yes, good yes, indeed. Uh, no, Lord Chairman, if I may, um, I'd like to turn back to the prospective uh, research uh, effort that's very impressive, clearly an important uh, UKRI uh, or, uh, investment or NHRI investment. But um, what I just wanted to be uh, clear about is beyond the one year of presumed follow up at the moment, uh, what arrangements are going to be made for longer term evaluation of these patients so we start to understand much more the natural history of, of this uh, long COVID uh, phenomenon? Uh, and in, in that regard, uh, it, it, would there be merit or is there the capacity to ensure at least some kind of prospective registry of all patients uh, that have suffered disease so that at a time in the future, if there were the need to identify individuals and perform some kind of follow up, uh, those facilities might be in place. And, and thirdly, what arrangements um, has there been any capacity to collect biological material from those patients during their hospital stay that would allow potentially uh, prospective evaluation of novel biomarkers or other uh, molecular assessment that might allow a better characterization of patients in the future who are at very high risk of long-term manifestations of this disease? Um, from all of you, quick, short answer, please. Start with uh, Professor Brightley. Yeah. Answer to question one, we have ethical approval to follow people up for 25 years, but only funding for one year. So we can do that once we have sufficient resource if there's a continuing problem. Uh, answer to question number two, we will be also linking up with a planned primary care, so a community-based cohort that hasn't yet been uh, funded but is being planned. But we can also then link up with some of the big data strategies that I know others are, are really the champions of. And if we can then link to uh, longer-term registries, then we absolutely will. And the answer to the third question is in the ISARIC for C observational follow-up, there was approximately 2,000 individuals who had bioresource collections at the time of the acute episode. We are including as many of those people as we possibly can as part of FOS COVID, and we'll be collecting bioresource in up to 4,000 individuals. We're also closely linked into what's called the UK CIC, which is the National Immunology Consortium. So we then have a very clear immunology stream where we'll be looking at your persistence of immunity based on your antibodies, but also your memory based on T and B cells, as well as then looking at inflammatory biomarkers that are then associated with different disease trajectories. So great, great questions, and they're definitely things we have in mind. Thank you. Um, do you want me to come in, Lord Patel? Yes, please. Yeah, just, just, just briefly, uh, I should have mentioned that I, I, I was, I'm privileged to chair the SAGE subcommittee on ethnic minority and COVID. And as part of that, we've brought all the data um, science together. Um, we've got a, a data group together, which uh, we have the best data in the world. UK definitely has the best data in the world. So we're bringing all the data, some of them that uh, um, uh, Professor Brightling mentioned, 
And once we've got these databases, we can not just look at the 12 months, but the longer term consequences, because we will have people who have had the disease at population level, and what are the outcomes um, in terms of the key outcomes, especially the cardiovascular, the respiratory, the mental health, hospitalization, the mortality, and compare them to those people who didn't have the disease. Um, so quite exciting prospects longer term as well. Thank you. Okay, Kaida. you done? Done, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I see your question about tissue didn't get answered, but maybe in the next session when we have pathologists there, we could ask them again. Lord Mayor. Thank you, Lord Chair. Could I, could I ask the witnesses um, to say something about fatigue? We, we've, um, is it the case that the fatigue that's being uh, reported by COVID sufferers you know, some, some months uh, after their outbreak, uh, is, it, is it more extreme than after other illnesses? Is it understood you know, what, what lies behind the fatigue? Um, perhaps Professor Breitling, could you answer that first? It seems to be associated with breathing difficulties, but is it, is it um, connected or, or separate? There seems to be a multitude of uh, reasons why people are getting fatigued post COVID. So in some cases it's deconditioning, so they're unable to exercise, so they're then also becoming weak and then uh, to, as part of that having fatigue. In some it's more like a chronic fatigue syndrome that's seen post viral with some other conditions and in others it's then actually um, directly related to damage to, to end organs such as damage to the lungs. So it comes in many different guises and we have a working group on chronic fatigue that <coughs> have, uh, have specialist interest in this particular area and we have a number of ways of trying to unpick that to then try and understand the underlying mechanisms because each of those are probably going to have a very different intervention and I think that's that's where it's going to be important. Thank you, Thank you very much. Lord Mayor. Uh, I, I wonder if the other other two witnesses have anything to add on this question um, of fatigue. Nothing yeah, for I'll, me. I'll come in quickly. Um, okay. I, I, I don't think we're going to be able to um, clearly define what the causes of fatigue are because it is as uh, Chris has mentioned multi-system dis disorder multiple inflammation, multiple immunological um, uh, um, comorbidities. We know about 50% have fatigue at uh, 60, 60 days, um, uh, but health related quality of life is reduced as well. So that could be impacting fatigue as well, the mental health aspects as well. So I think it's very difficult to stangle what is the real cause of the fatigue, but as said, Chris uh, and there are many others who will be trying to distangle uh, the key reason, but it's going to be very difficult, I think. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, now, I'm going to let Baroness Young ask a question as one time Queen of Diabetes UK, I couldn't leave her out. Baroness Young. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it's really both to um, Professor Breitling and, and Professor Kunti, um, and it's moving away from the research that you've described is there a systematic approach at a service level beginning to emerge either locally or across the NHS to routinize the long-term follow-up and patient review? I know that Camlesh is very keen on the NHS health check being used for um, patient, patients from a, a black minority ethnic background at a much earlier age as a way of routinizing follow-up and risk assessment. Um, but should we be applying that to all post-COVID patients? Should there be a post-COVID system of making sure that people aren't just suffering in silence at home and getting worse in the way that um, was described earlier? I'm happy to start and then maybe Chris and, and uh, others can take, uh, Bob and I can take it. Um, we, we don't know the natural history of this condition. We do know it's a multi-system disease. We know cardiovascular disease is affected. We know that it has insulin resistance, so it has an impact in terms of development of diabetes. We know there's an issue with uh, chronic kidney disease and uh, my good friend, Professor O'Donnell, he's gonna be there later, I'm sure talking about that. But we, we don't have the history behind this, but we know all these systems are affected. So it makes sense to follow these people up. We have uh, and the NHS Health Checks program at the moment where people are over the age of 40, are screened on a five-year interval. If they don't, if they have, don't have the 
Um, this, this lends itself. I'm hearing echoing. Sorry. Um, this lends itself in terms of some form of a longer term surveillance program in people who've had uh, uh, COVID, who've been COVID positive, because we've already heard that there is a multi system uh, problem. In terms of the, the black minority ethnic health population, I think that the, re, the plea there was that we know, and I, I chaired the NICE guidelines on prevention of diabetes, that uh, screening people uh, from the age of 25 to 39 of uh, ethnic minority populations is not just cost effective, but it's cost saving in terms of diabetes, pre-diabetes and prevention program. Um, we'd, we would recommend doing that for cardiovascular disease, kidney disease as well, because we've seen the inequalities that COVID has shown uh, uh, in terms of minority ethnic health populations. So trying to screen these people early and managing those uh, risk factors early may be uh, somewhere to go, but this is uh, really, it, that we don't have the evidence for it. This is just a, 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 one of the recommendations that we're making. Okay. Mr. Breitling, are you? So if I add very, very briefly, so I think there definitely should be integrated multidisciplinary healthcare approach to the consequences of COVID. As part of the research program, essentially, we've started there because we've had to go through all the centres and actually try and understand what their clinical service looked like. And it ranged from a multidisciplinary uh, complex clinic through to people saying, well, we have no post-COVID follow-up and we're relying on the primary care physician to just refer people in when they've got significant pathology. So there is really a very large spread of access to healthcare post-COVID, which I think definitely there'd be value in, in improving that and having a more integrated national service. And I think certainly the, the good examples are where all of the specialists have come together and we've certainly learned from each other. And in our clinic, as an example, we also have diabetes experts actually as part of the follow-up clinic. And, and do you have any feelings about the NHS health check or is it a busted flush? I don't know if Kamlesh wants to comment on that first. I think the health checks program has to has worked to a certain extent. We identified lots of people who are at risk of diabetes, and we've had thousands going through the prevention program. And we've seen um, from the data we published and others have published that it does lead to weight reductions. I think it's early days in terms of whether we can prevent outcomes, but obviously COVID has uh, put spanners in the works in terms of uh, seeing these patients, uh, and they're, they're having it delivered remotely. But I'm not sure how effective it is being delivered remotely. So that's an NHS England answer, Thomas Young. Absolutely, Chairman. <laughs> so we've got only two minutes left. So let me just ask a general question. Most of the treatments, and you mentioned some, Professor Breitling, are related to people who are patients who are admitted with COVID-19 infection, admitted to hospital. Otherwise, we just tell patients to stay at home, rest and only go to hospital or call 111 if something happens. Uh, why is it, are you, have you got at a stage where we can suggest some treatment at early phase of the disease once the test is positive? Professor Brightley. A great question to which the, the, the very simple answer is we, we don't have those data and the best treatment uh, in terms of reducing mortality, dexamethasone, so corticosteroids, actually led to uh, an adverse, so, so worsening of outcome in those that were uh, more mild that were emitted, suggesting that if you took that treatment in the community, it might actually lead to more harm than, than good. So at the what moment, we don't have that data. What about antiviral? So the, anti, so the antiviral data is largely, again, in, in inpatients. In the, in the UK, this comes back in part to testing. So the, so the testing focus was very much for inpatients. So in the peak, we, we clearly had people in the community who obviously had COVID and obviously had symptoms of COVID, but we didn't have clarity with, with testing. So the community-based studies uh, have not been done in the same numbers and didn't start as early as the inpatient studies. So I think antivirals may well be very valuable. There's been antiviral studies acutely with remdesivir, 
which is now available. And then there's also other antiviral therapies, which in very small studies have been uh, very promising, such as interferon beta. And these are going to be tested further in the inpatient uh, setting for interferon beta. And I know remdesivir are looking further into community uh, basis, but it will be dependent upon treating early. So that comes back to some of the early discussion around uh, making sure that we have appropriate testing available early. And if we had tests that could actually screen people before they become very symptomatic, that would be even better. But we're some way from that. Most of the patients that you see when they come to the hospital got pneumonia already. So a number of the people that are emitted are emitted between day seven and 10. So absolutely, there would have been a prodrome that we could have then potentially changed the trajectory of their disease to then actually prevent them coming into hospital. Um, I'm completely in agreement with the direction of the question, which is shouldn't we actually be putting our focus on stopping the disease becoming severe rather yeah. than our efforts on treating people who are severe? And that, that absolutely should be the case. And there's certainly studies to, to try and do that but they haven't progressed as quickly as the studies within hospital. So there's one study called the principal trial. That's the main one that's being conducted in primary care at the moment. So these are patients who are not experiencing severe symptoms. Um, uh, and that's a randomized control trial run from Oxford, looking at the azithromycin and uh, doxycycline uh, against the usual care. But early days, we haven't got any results as yet. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'm very sorry to say our time is up because there are lots of things we could have asked you about. But we're very grateful to all three of you for coming today to help us with our inquiry. Uh, please stay on if you have time because we'll have to move on straight away uh, to the next session. So thank you and welcome uh, to our witnesses for the next session. I presume you're all there. So if I might start straight away. And Professor O'Donoghue, you're going to go first. Thank you very much for the invitation to uh, join you today. Uh, I, I'm a kidney doctor in Salford. I'm also the registrar at the Royal College of Physicians and I'm chair of Kidney Care UK, the patient charity. Um, I'm also chair of the ISN advocacy group um, and the immediate past president of the Renal Association. And I was the national clinical director for uh, kidney care um, from 2007 to, to 13. Uh, and, and there are probably four points that I want to, to make. Um, firstly, that kidney disease is, is common and, and harmful and um, very much related to, to, to COVID, but it's silent. Uh, the second, uh, and where I'll give you most of the information, is the impact of acute kidney um, injury, uh, acute renal failure uh, in, in COVID. Of course, people with kidney disease are also affected by the delays to uh, uh, rest restoration of, of normal services and the disruption um, as, as other uh, services. So 85% or greater reduction in, in referrals for a period of three months uh, and disruption almost completely to transplantation for a period of time. Good to see that that's back up and running, but live donation, which carries additional risks for for, uh, for, for live donors as well requires greater uh, infection prevention control measures is still slow to get started and, and half of all our donors are live donors these days. So that's, that's a major issue. And of course, a large part of the kidney population shielding because of the high risks to, uh, to them with, with COVID and the consequences of, of that as, the, as they play out. Obviously that's similar for other uh, patient groups as well. Uh, and perhaps an important point, given the conversations uh, ju just now, uh, people with kidney disease are often excluded from clinical trials. Uh, so the vast body of um, research in cardiovascular uh, studies uh, excluded people with kidney disease for, for many, many years. I think that's starting to improve now. Uh, but I was disappointed to read last week that 45% of all intervention trials exclude people with kidney disease. And there's really no, no good reason for that. It's, 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 it's almost ignorance. So kidney disease uh, affects around 15% of the adult population in the UK, according to uh, Health Survey for England, uh, associated with age, uh, uh, with uh, BAME, uh, 
non non Europeans are at very high rates of, of kidney disease, sometimes up to six times the rates in the uh, uh, Caucasian population. Um, the global burden of disease is about 850 million people, and the uh, by, by, by 2040, it will be the fifth most common cause of years of life uh, lost. Uh, and that's chronic kidney disease. Acute kidney injuries often thought of as a condition that the kidney shuts down and then repairs and recovers from. Uh, and that's what I was taught in medical school, but I think it was, it was still taught of, uh, you know, a few years ago in that vein. However, um, 16% of all people admitted uh, for non-elective uh, admissions in normal times uh, develop acute kidney injury in hospital and uh, that's about half a million people and, and we know there's a similar proport a similar number um, in the community that don't get admitted to hospital. 12% of all people uh, who develop acute kidney injury require dialysis um, end up on re replacement therapy within the next five years. So that's the background uh, to, to it. And really kidney disease dwarfs other risk factors uh, for severe outcomes, hospitalization and death, uh, um, uh, apart from age. Uh, so in all the, all the various anal analyses and the elegant work that uh, Julia Hipsley Cox is doing, that's that's the, the disease factor that, that comes out uh, um, um, very, very, enormously. Uh, similarly with the MRC stratification study that was uh, reported over the weekend. Uh, and apart from respiratory disease, it really dwarfs other uh, organ systems in terms of in terms of impact. So just some some data from King's that is um, reflected in, in other published uh, uh, data sets. So at King's, uh, around about a thousand patients, 58% um, of them uh, had pre-existing kidney disease. Um, Forty percent um, developed acute kidney injury, and the mortality in those was forty-two percent. Um, and and it's studies from 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 New York: fifty percent uh, mortality in the acute kidney injury group versus eight percent in those who don't get uh, acute kidney injury. So so really quite staggering. Uh, and then in terms of long COVID, the, what is the recovery? So back to that King's uh, uh, data, 36% uh, of, of those that um, survived their acute kidney injury didn't return to their previous level of, of kidney function. So what will happen to those patients over time is a key uh, research uh, question and a key service uh, delivery question, uh, um, I, I think. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much indeed. Professor Brandner? Yes, good morning. Um, I'm Sebastian Brandner. I am, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah, Sebastian Brandner. I'm Professor of Neuropathology at University College London, and I'm Honorary Consultant Neuropathologist at the National Hospital, uh, which is part of University College Hospitals. But I'm elect member of the English Regional Council at the Royal College of Pathologists. So I would like to give you an overview of what happens in the central nervous system of patients who uh, suffer from or died of um, uh, COVID-19. So the central nervous system, as is brain and spinal cord, are involved uh, in the proportion of patients with COVID-19. And to give you an idea on the frequencies, I quote a study uh, of over 3,200 COVID-19 patients. There's a study from New York University which were all admitted to hospital. So 3,200 patients admitted to the hospital. Of those, 450, that's 14%, had brain imaging during the um, inpatient stay. And of, uh, of all those patients with the imaging, 38 uh, had uh, some form of stroke in the brain. So that's 1%, 1.2% 1, 1 of those 3,200 admitted to hospital. So it's not a very large number. And a fatal outcome was seen in approximately half of those admitted. So one in 150 admitted to hospital had a fatal outcome related to CNS complications. Other studies that have uh, looked at similar numbers, similar frequencies, uh, have been reported one and a half, two and a half percent of strokes. So I would like to explain to you a bit more what happens in the brain. First of all, to say we as pathologists in this context, 
we have seen only very few uh, of those patients with complications. Of course, most of the complications are survived, fortunately, but also, and that's the disadvantage or the uh, downside, there's very limited availability of post-mortem exams of the brain. During this entire COVID-19 uh, outbreak, we had only uh, just over a dozen or perhaps two dozens of postmortems with available brains for um, full uh, analysis. So there's currently no large postmortem study around with more than one or two dozen brain autopsies. None of those have been published. And those which have been published, however, show all recurring findings in the central nervous system. I would like to explain those now. Uh, the complications that we found uh, in COVID-19, they all occur in the context of systemic disease. We heard a lot about the systemic diseases and the complications are acute ischemic stroke. So lack of oxygen to a perfusion problem in the brain, but also inflammation of the meninges and the brain and spinal cord. So that's called meningoencephalitis. So microbleeds, as well as a diffuse leukoencephalopathy, and that is a disease of the brain white matter. So let's start with the common ones. The disturbances of the blood clotting in COVID-19, so we heard a lot about this in the previous session, they can obviously cause varied amounts and sizes of blood clots to enter the brain circulation. And a blood clot entering the brain circulation causes a stroke, an infarct, and depending on the size of the clot, it can be a very, very small infarct, micro infarct, that can be seen practically only under the microscope on a tissue exam, up to very large regional, uh, regional or global strokes, which are usually then a cause of death. So we have seen such strokes of small and also very large sizes in the brain. And these strokes can be associated with hemorrhages, so bleeds of varied sizes which again are caused and often also aggravated by these systemic clotting problems, which can also be aggravated by certain treatments. In the previous session, we heard something about ECMO, which is, a, a, is a, done for oxygenation of the blood, but this can also aggravate clotting problems. Uh, the other complication that uh, cause uh, disturbances of the brain are the lung complication. All the respiratory problems in patients with COVID-19 can potentially cause a lack of oxygen in the circulation, including the brain, and that is a condition called hypoxia. And hypoxia in the brain causes the death of nerve cells, often in a very diffuse uh, distribution. Finally, another complication in COVID-19 is brain inflammation. So this inflammation is thought generally to occur in the context of systemic disease. And brain inflammation is a common manifestation in, in, in multi-organ failure, so kidney, liver, heart, all the things that we heard about uh, previously. And regardless of the cause, so the brain inflammation is not necessarily specific to COVID, but a term that has been often brought into this context is the cytokine storm, which is a massive and probably inappropriate activation of immune response. And we think that some of the unusual findings in the strokes in the brain are related to such a cytokine storm. So th among those brains that we examined, we found that some of the areas in the strokes showed a very severe and very unusual inflammation so it is thought that this immune response can trigger some of the inflammation in the context of the strokes. So we have also seen much milder inflammation in the meninges. So the meninges are the membranes covering the brain and in the brain itself. And this has always correlated really well with the imaging findings. What is currently not very well established is the role of the virus itself in causing direct effects. So it's thought there might be viral entered into the brain by blood vessels or directly by docking onto the receptors of the surface of the brain cells. But it's actually thought that this has probably no major role. And instead that the CNS complications of brain and spinal cord and the meninges are secondary to systemic, to systemic illness rather than direct viral brain invasion. So conclusion, there's not a single cause of brain involvement, but there's a range of systemic conditions that cause the brain complications. And the most important complication to sum it up uh, of COVID in the brain are strokes, hypoxia, 
and information. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Professor Solomon? Thank you very much. My name is Professor Tom Solomon, and I'm the director of the National Institute for Health Research, Health Protection Research Unit in Emerging Infections. I'm also Professor of Neurology here at the University of Liverpool and the Walton Centre NHS Foundation Trust. I head a large research team who have been working on emerging infections for many years, and particularly those that impact on the brain. And our emerging infections research on COVID-19 started in mid-January, actually, before it was even called COVID-19. And we supported the setup of the large Isaric clinical characterization protocol, which is the largest study in the world looking at hospitalized patients. It's studied more than 70,000. And it's given us many of, uh, much of this important information on risk factors for particular patients and what their outcomes might be. Now, as we heard from earlier witnesses, uh, we initially thought this was going to be a respiratory disease, but it's become clear now that it does affect all parts of the body, including the brain, as we've just been hearing about from Professor Branner, uh, from a pathological viewpoint. I'm going to provide more of a clinical perspective. And in particular, I'm going to talk about three aspects which have important long-term health implications and I think have important questions for this committee to think about. So firstly, uh, COVID-19 causes neurological diseases such as stroke, as we've been hearing about, also delirium, which is confusion in uh, patients in hospital. And one cause of this is encephalitis, which is inflammation of the brain. Sometimes this is directly due to the virus. More often, it seems it's an indirect effect of the body's overall response to the infection. The stroke is especially common. We've uh, led some studies from Liverpool uh, both across the UK and also global studies looking at comparative data. And it's clear that stroke is the most important neurological uh, problem that we're seeing. So we need to think about how we can prevent patients with COVID-19 developing strokes. And indeed those who have had a stroke, what do we need to do to make sure that they don't have uh, subsequent strokes afterwards? Because this is often a risk factor after somebody's had one stroke. Now the other really important thing for all these patients with any neurological complication of COVID-19 is rehabilitation of those who've had long-term illness. And there's some fantastic work done by the NHS uh, in conjunction with charities like the Stroke Association, the Encephalitis Society, but more work is needed in this area. Rehabilitation is going to be a big issue. It already is. Now the government announced uh, some CECOL rehabilitation centres a few months ago, which would be specifically for COVID-19 patients. But in the last few days, there's been some uncertainty about how much actual cash there will be to support capital build of new centres and to support refurbishment of centres. So this, I think, is something important that we need to keep an eye on. The second group of patients are those who've had COVID-19 infection and it's caused mental illness. And this can range from frank psychotic episodes in hospital to those who are suffering from anxiety and depression after they've recovered. We've heard quite a bit today about long COVID, and this includes not just the physical problems like breathlessness, but also mental health problems, uh, anxiety, depression, and then potentially neurological problems, uh, muscle pain, fatigue, etc. And GPs are calling uh, for patients to be assessed. They're seeing lots of patients now with these problems. This is really the current uh, epidemic in, in, in primary care. They're seeing lots of patients who are left over with problems from their COVID and they need to be able to refer them to get help in understanding what's going on. Now in Liverpool, for many years, we've had a combined clinic, a neurological infectious disease clinical service, which would look at patients like this. But across the country, that there's not much of a service provision for uh, this kind of patient. And in fact, in the UK, uh, we have one neurologist for every 40,000 patients. This compares with across Europe, where it's one neurologist for every 15,000 patients. The third group I want to think about are people who were not infected with COVID-19 at all, but have still been seriously affected by the pandemic in terms of mental ill health. And again, this is probably even a bigger number than those who were actually infected with the virus. Mental, mental health services, as we know, uh, have had chronic underfunding. And potentially this now is a chance to really review the support that we give people with mental health problems from children all the way through to the elderly. I'll stop there. Thank you very much indeed. That was extremely helpful. So can I just start with my colleagues now? And as a, again, if we keep questions as brief as possible and answers to the point, I might get through a lot of questions, which I have no doubt will help. Alice Manningham-Buller. Thank you, 
Lucha, and thank you for our witnesses. That was a very interesting session. I've really got a, a general question, which has um, two parts to it. We've heard of a very wide range of symptoms in long term COVID, and I have two parts to my question. How much of that is explicable by what we already understand of the disease? And how much is still very not well understood on which, for example, you might like to focus research if the resources were available? So where, where are the, the biggest gaps on which you'd like some answers where money could be focused if it was available? Thank you. Could I start with, with that yes, one? Please. Yes, please, Professor Solomon. Uh, thank you. Um, I think it's a, a good point. I mean, one thing that has characterised the UK compared with the rest of the world is the, the research response has been fantastic. We've had incredible support from the government and other funders to, to do the research. And this is why we lead the world with uh, programmes like the Azaric programme, the FOST COVID we heard about earlier, the treatment trials, which are answering really important questions like steroids. And I've no doubt that our vaccine work also will be world leading. Um, but there are some surprising gaps, and, and actually one of these gaps is interestingly on the neurological disease. So we don't yet have any specific large funding programmes in this area, although we're, uh, I must declare an interest, we're currently in the middle of an application. Um, but I, I think uh, you asked about which questions are, or which symptoms are explicable and which are not understood. And I, I think some of these neurological problems where we don't actually find the virus is in the central nervous system, but we need to understand how the infection has triggered some of these problems. That's one area which I think we still need to focus on. Thank you very much, um, Professor. I don't have the other two witnesses. Yes, so, so, Professor O'Donoghue here. So yes. I, I think that um, the people who've been um, uh, shielded are a particular group and the impact on those individuals, I think, is an area that, that's uh, well worth uh, studying. Um, and the majority of patients who, who get COVID uh, have a range of comorbidities, as we've heard from a number of people today. So I think any of the research needs to be comprehensive in terms of the populations that it looks at and not exclude people because they've got a range of disease processes that uh, you know makes it more challenging to uh, investigate issues of uh, fatigue and uh, uh, you know psychological anxiety depression issues it'd be important that that they you know, we don't exclude people in our research studies thank you professor Bradner. Yeah, so from our perspective, it would be um, important to understand how the uh, disease affects the brain. To do this, we obviously need uh, material uh, to study the effects of the brain. Yes, there have been amazing studies uh, on clinical radiological correlation. Uh, these have provided fantastic insight. Uh, into the disease pathogenesis, how the systemic effects of COVID-19 can affect the central nervous system. But very often, this is where it ends. And the gap here that we see from the pathology community, there was a fantastic and uh, enthusiastic, respo enthusiastic response from pathologists, but very often not enough patients who died of COVID-19 related uh, illnesses with or without central nervous system involvement have actually uh, undergone autopsy despite the availability of more trees, but there was often a reluctance uh, from NHS hospitals, understandably because they had to divert, divert resources to the treatment and to the management of these patients. But yet um, we are seeing that the 1918 pandemic, which, result, which had a remarkable lack of post-mortem material to study, has repeated itself, and I think there are still opportunities, but this is something would be important to address that, in particular now when we are in a more balanced uh, position that resources have kind of readjusted. Mortaries are not overwhelmed with, with um, people who are dying of any type of uh, complications. Uh, to facilitate this sort of uh, research, and this would be uh, really important to understand the um, uh, the pathogenesis on the Thank central you. nervous system. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very much. Viscount Ridley. Uh, thank you, Lord Chairman. Um, I realise that Professor Brandner and Professor Solomon are neurologists and not psychologists, but still we have already touched on 
fatigue, anxiety, depression, and other mental health effects uh, as a result of uh, COVID-19. Can you say or speculate about whether these are direct effects of the disease, either through um, uh, fatigue or uh, direct physiological consequences, or whether they are mostly the indirect effects of lockdown? Um, and are they confined to those who've been in hospital, or are we also seeing the effect in the community? And when will we be able to say whether or not there has been uh, an impact on the statistics of suicide? I'll, I'll go first again, if you if, Okay, if you please. Um, uh, I, I think that's a really important question. I think it's an unanswered question. Um, we don't know the extent to which the big mental health, um, maybe epidemics too dramatic a word, but we're certainly seeing a lot of uh, mental illness. We don't know the extent to which that is directly related to the virus. I think the fact that we're seeing um, quite a lot in people who have clearly not been infected with the virus perhaps does indicate to us, it does tell us that a certain amount of this is just because of the effects of, of the pandemic on, on uh, people's normal activities. You know, the effect of lockdown, not being able to interact with people, uh, difficulties with exercise, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I think some of it is that, but it's a really critical question about whether this virus, either directly in the body or, or, or indirectly through the body through causing things like cytokine cascades and, and other aspects, is, is, is leading to some of these mental health issues. These are the kind of questions that we, we want to be addressing. Thank you very much. Does anybody else want to come in? I like think I'm... it was uh, very well put. I think I can't add anything to that. And uh, just for the record, I'm not a neurologist, but a neuropathologist, which is still a little bit further distance from the uh, distant from the psychology. Well, I... I was always taught pathology is always at the last word and the answer. Why can't Ridley? The, th thank you, Chairman. I do apologize for calling Professor Brandner a, a neurologist and not a neuropathologist. Have, have you finished or you? Yes, I've finished. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Is Baroness Rock? Uh, uh, thank you, Lord Chairman. Um, I I'd like to just ask two questions. One is a, is further on the the, the mental health um, services, and um, what data is being used to capture um, the, um, uh, the the provisions around what is needed in terms of mental health services? And perhaps Pro Professor Fox Solomon, if you could just um, give a, a little bit more detail on that, and um, just taking the data question a bit further as well. Um, what are the barriers that you're finding um, are there in gathering data reliably in terms of the, uh, of the wider effects of, of COVID? Perhaps Professor Solomon could start. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, again, I, I should um, preface my answer. I'm, I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist, I'm a neurologist, but um, I, you know, I don't want to duck the question, so I'll give you the best answer I can. Um, I think, uh, in terms of mental health services, I think mental health services have suffered even before this pandemic. I, I don't think that's a secret to anyone um, that uh, mental health has increased in recent years and the service provision has not. Um, I think it's, I mean, to capture data in terms of what is needed, I, I, my understanding is that this would just be about looking at waiting lists. Um, but part of the worry with that is that sometimes people are not even put on waiting lists. If you know there's no service, uh, or you know it's gonna take more than a year to see uh, someone, then to some extent, people will just not bother. They'll either try and sort things out privately, or, the, or they'll not be able to get help at all, which I, I think is not a great uh, situation. But um, Donal O'Donoghue, from a Royal College of Physicians uh, perspective, maybe has a, has a different view on the broader provision. Professor Professor O'Donoghue, more widely. So I think uh, uh, Tom's right that the uh, provision in mental health is is poor and patchy with long delays um, and and challenges both in serious and enduring mental health um, and 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 also lesser degrees of of mental illness that, that are, can be quite catastrophic uh, for 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 people. Um, I think we've got an opportunity to think about providing more holistic care than we have done uh, pr previously 
you know, we, we're mainly dealing not just in a COVID world, but in, in, in the world we are in this 21st century, we're mainly dealing with people who have a, a number of conditions. And certainly in the kidney world, you know, it's very unusual to see somebody who just has kidney disease. And if they just have kidney disease, a short time after that, they will develop vascular disease and all the other complications. We see that in cancer and, and so on and so, so, so forth. Uh, and, and, and we know that the burden of of minor mental illness, anxiety, depression is very high in those with long-term conditions. And we know that it has a very big impact on, on the amount of resource utilization and their, their clinical outcomes. So I think there's a real opportunity to, you know, to, to, to work harder about parity of esteem. And that's been on the cards for a long time, uh, but we need to shift the needle on that. And, and maybe with the resource constraints uh, and the uh, capacity constraints that come from the you know the situation we're in with, with, with having to have infection prevention control measures in place uh, uh, maybe one of the things we can uh, try and major on is actually uh, more integrated approaches uh, thinking about the, the challenge of you know, of, of, of the follow up of all these people who've had, you know, uh, uh, COVID, both in the community and in hospital, uh, and the capacity constraints in primary care and, and secondary care, we, we really need to work hard at integrating the data and, and ensuring that, you know, it's a one stop shop for most people most of the time. And, and why can't that involve uh, mental health issues as well and, and signposting and, and, and so forth. That's a quite a radical change from you know how we've siloed things in the past but I think we, we do need to do that uh, and it's likely that if we can do that that we will get a, a, a benefit in, in terms of both the, the, the population to study for research but also being able to implement the things that we know now that we're not doing as well as uh, you know find new treatments for for, for these affected populations we, we we have really no idea what the long term consequences for you know respiratory disease and for kidney disease and for the, the, the major organs affected you know what is the outcome here in, in you know in terms of end stage renal failure or in terms of respiratory failure over the next 5 years it could be a considerably greater number of people than we see developing those end stage organ disease conditions uh, in, in normal times. Thank you very much. Bernice Rock, have you finished? I've finished, thank you, Lord Chair. Thank you, okay. Bernice Sheer. Thank you, Lord Chair. Uh, may I ask um, what evidence there is that uh, neurological issues can occur in mild or asymptomatic cases and um, which of the neurological effects of COVID-19 will have long-term health implications? And uh, within that, I wonder, uh, Professor um, Solomon, you, you mentioned uh, the importance of um, dedicated rehabilitation centres, given the, the, the multitude of organs that can be affected. Can I just ask um, um, each of you to, to, to say a little bit more about um, whether the capacity within the NHS is um, showing signs of preparedness uh, to deal with, with these um, patients suffering from longer term um, COVID-19 effects and whether the specialisms such as physios, occupational therapists, those professionals and essential support staff are there. Thank you. Um... So uh, the first question, in terms of mild or asymptomatic neurological disease, if, if somebody has brain disease but no symptoms, you won't know about it from anything that they report in terms of how they feel or, or bits of their body that aren't working. But um, you pick it up from other types of research approach. So the, uh, the New York uh, scanning uh, uh, project that um, we heard about earlier from Professor Bradner, that was... Um, 3,000 patients who had brain scans done and uh, just over 1% of them had evidence of a stroke on the scan. So it was like a mini stroke. It was not something that caused them to have weakness in an arm or a leg. But when you did the brain scan, you found that there was evidence of, of um, we, we would use the term subclinical stroke. Now you would find if you took 3,000 people off the street and did brain scans on them, you would find uh, evidence of vascular disease, mini strokes, and in particular, depending on the age of the population. Uh, so 
Um, you have to take uh, such findings in context, but those are the kind of approaches that will tell us there has been uh, damage, if you like, without the patient being aware of it. Um, you asked about the uh, dedicated services. I mean, this is what the Royal College of General Practitioners are, are calling for um, in terms of specialist clinics that will deal specifically with the consequences of COVID-19. And as Professor O'Donoghue was saying, I think you know this might be a, an interesting approach where traditionally we think of clinics for neurological problems or respiratory problems or kidney problems it's quite rare to have clinics that are combined um, and certainly we, we do our, our brain infections clinic which is infectious diseases and neurology combined but to have a, a service that also combines say respiratory disease and, and, and renal disease it would require quite a shake-up but it is quite a novel way of, of thinking about it um, I think, uh, and finally, you, you asked about the capacity, uh, uh, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, etc. Th these people are absolutely key uh, to getting you back up and on your feet if you've had a stroke. Um, and uh, their service is hampered anyway, because currently everything that anyone does in the NHS is has to be COVID secure, if you like. Uh, we have to make sure the patients don't have the virus. We have to make sure everybody is protected. So that already is like operating with one arm behind your back in terms of capacity. And, um, but I, I increasingly, I think people are looking at innovative ways of, of doing things. I, I was chairing one of the UK RI, UK Research and Innovation Committees that was funding research across the country. And um, we, we were supporting very innovative projects, for example, looking at how you can do physio and occupational therapy remotely how you don't need to be with the patient all the time, how much of it can you do uh, with an iPad or, or, or Zoom, et cetera. So I, I think that these, you know, this pandemic is, obviously it's a terrible thing in many, many ways, um, but some of the things that may come out of it are new ways of working, which, which may be helpful in the longer run. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are you so done? I would echo uh, echo those comments about that okay. we need to think about new ways of doing things. The workforce okay. shortage is just so so okay. uh, so short so, in in rehabilitation. So, so in relation to Banner Sheehan's question and answer that we just got from Professor Solomon and you about you said before, Professor Donald, what has the College of Physicians that represents twenty seven different disciplines in medicine? and the Royal College of General Practitioners, have they done any work and produced any papers to suggest what kind of care post-COVID people should have and where and by whom? So we have produced some, some work on, on how we can work more closely together and, and support people with okay. uh, new ways of working. I can send okay. the details through. That, that'd be very good if you, if you don't mind sending it in because that might help answer Banashian's question, which is a good question. Banashian? Um, yes, I did just want to ask a quick uh, follow up question to Professor Solomon, who I, I see has a specialism in, in emerging in zoonotic diseases. And that is um, is there anything um, that uh, COVID 19 uh, has, has manifested itself as having surprised you? You could put the question the other way around. Is there anything that's not surprised me? Um, <laughs> I think, uh, I mean, we've known, so I work in emerging infections and we, we've, we've known uh, about a, a pandemic uh, that it could happen at any time. I have on the back of my door, there is our business continuity plan. And I, I checked and yes, indeed, pandemic was on there. But I think there's a big difference between theoretically knowing something could happen and then it actually happening um, and a pandemic of this scale. I mean, we've had other flu pandemics. The last one was 2008, but it proved to be a pretty mild, uh, weedy virus that didn't cause anything like the problems that, that this SARS-CoV-2 is, is doing. So, um, you know, this is a first for me, as it is for, I think, everybody living through it. So it's almost a new surprise every day. I, I think um, someone in my team actually you know, I wear two hats. One is a sort of emerging infections hat and one is the, is the neuro neurology hat. And somebody in the team early on said, um, we should think about uh, this respiratory virus causing neurological problems. And I was kind of so busy 
dealing with the problem that was definitely facing us that perhaps we were a little slower getting onto the neurology than, than we should have been. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's a question that you could answer, you could spend an hour answering it and two hours discussing it, but I'll stop there. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Baroness Wormsley. Baroness Wormsley. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one is specifically for Lord, uh, for Professor O'Donoghue and the other is more general. So Professor O'Donoghue, are the effects in the kidneys and liver because they have a lot of blood vessels in them or is the virus attacking them directly? And are these treatable or are we going to have to go into much more radical treatments in larger numbers like uh, dialysis and a much bigger demand for transplantation? And are we prepared for that? That's a great question. So the kidney does have the receptors that the virus would uh, have affinity for. And there is some work to suggest that the virus does affect the kidney specifically. But most of the post-mortem uh, studies and, and, and the, most of the opinion now is that people are developing their kidney injury uh, really on the basis of the systemic disease that they're getting. Uh, so, so normally we see, you know, maybe 20% of people that go on to intensive care unit need to have, you know, a form of dialysis. Uh, during COVID, it, it was up to, up to 40% and 85% of people had some degree of, of, of kidney injury. No doubt that's happening out in the community as well, probably to a lesser extent, uh, but no doubt it's happening um, out there. Uh, and from a kidney perspective, that that's that's the, the unknown as to well, how many of these individuals will then go on to have more severe kidney disease as a consequence of having that initial insult? The data looks like a third of people who who survive um, will have some degree of of kidney impairment, and and you know if 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 you know even a small percentage of those. Uh, go on to have progressive kidney injury there's two imperatives two or three imperatives the first one is to do everything we can to slow down that uh, disease process which isn't rocket science but does need to be identified and treated and managed blood pressure control and and and, and so forth uh, two is to be to be planning for the increase uh, because it could be you know it could easily be tens of thousands more more people requiring dialysis transplantation in a normal year, we'd we, we'd accept around about three, around about six thousand five hundred people onto to uh, dialysis and transplant programs. So so you can see the order of magnitude, and, and it needs to be it needs to be modelled out and then and then and then worked through. Uh, and and then the issue about including people with kidney disease in trials. So we've got the ludicrous thing that, that, that people are excluded from trials yet they're the highest risk. Uh, and they're excluded from trials because, because somebody's thought, well, we don't know how to manage this drug if there's reduced kidney function. And things like hydroxychloroquine, which is a treatment for lupus nephritis for a kidney condition, people are excluded from trials of, of chloroquine uh, because oh, that make it more complicated. As, as I said in the introduction, 45% of people with kidney disease, 45% of trials exclude people with kidney disease. And yet these are, these are you know, a very high risk uh, uh, population that we can, we can learn so much from. Thank you. Thank May I ask my more general question, please? Um, which is, uh, given what all our witnesses have said this morning about the long-term effects of the virus, even many of them amongst those who've had mild symptoms, is the idea that we could encourage herd immunity by allowing a lot of less vulnerable people to get it a much more dangerous strategy than it at first appeared? And should we be messaging younger people who are pretty confident they won't get seriously ill that they may have some very nasty long-term effects afterwards? So, so, I, so I'll, I'll give a short answer. Yes, it, it, it would be foolish to go down that route for all the reasons we know now about the, the consequences of having had uh, COVID and how they may play out. And, and of course, we don't know 
we don't know what the consequences will be in, in, in younger people. So we've got a fairly good idea in children, but in, in it, we, we all know of friends and relatives that are, you know, we think of as relatively young and are relatively young, you know, who, who are having serious problems uh, and, and what the long-term consequences, you know, might be neurologically, cardiovascular, renal wise, I think, you know, it's t t we, we, we just don't know. One would be much better to go down a vaccination route, I think. Thank you. Do either of the other witnesses want to comment about that? Uh, just a brief comment. I completely agree that we have uh, no idea currently what the long term effects might be. You know, there are viral long term effects that we can't even predict now that might come up in 10, 20 years. Neurodegeneration has been um, a problem in previous uh, pandemics, the very famous 1918 pandemic, which caused Parkinsonism. And um, there are uh, long term effects on the aggregation of neurodegenerative proteins. We don't know this. Um, I've been involved in other studies, under, completely unrelated to COVID, over the last 15, 20 years. Uh, where it turns out that um, uh, pathogens, specifically aggregated proteins, can be transmitted in a way that we had no idea about uh, 20 or 30 years ago. Currently, this is not a problem anymore because practices have changed. I just want to say this could happen again with a completely new pathogen that is untested and uh, relatively preliminarily uh, characterized. Um, so we should be, uh, I agree that vaccination programs are probably uh, better than trying to rely on a herd immunity, which may not even happen because if the immunity um, uh, um, ceases after a certain period, uh, then we're starting all over again. So vaccination seems- Okay, a, yeah. thank you very much. Lord Winston, I saw you nodding there. Lord Winston, your yes, question. Yes, uh, I, I, I'm very concerned that we've completely missed one very important part of healthcare, which is not the fault of our witnesses, but perhaps our fault in a way, and that's women's health. There are, in the United Kingdom, some 700,000 births annually and a good deal more pregnancies than that. And one of the issues is what are the long-term effects on the fetus, given that during the... Um, the time of the pandemic, a large number of fetuses would have been at the time of the uh, when 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 there is development of organs, organogenesis. Certainly, uh, it's certainly at the beginning of organogenesis, and we know with other viruses that does have an effect. Would um, our witnesses perhaps give us any kind of help on where we might find out about what follow-up is being done on those pregnancies, and whether or not, for example, there's any post-mortem material? on the products of conception of women who've miscarried and what we know about perhaps the brain in fetuses which have died uh, during the pandemic. Uh, thank you. I press, can I start with Pat, uh, Professor O'Donoghue perhaps? Uh, I was going to defer to Professor Solomon. Uh, so I so, thought you might. so, so uh, well, let's go straight to Professor Solomon rather than me waste well, time. But, but Professor Bregner might also know about pathology. So anyway, Professor Solomon first. Um, I, I think I can help a little bit because uh, our unit, we, we, we were heavily involved in the um, Zika global health emergency, which, is, as you know, did have uh, severe impacts on pregnancy and, uh, and on, on uh, newborn children. So I think the first thing to say is that there has not been any great signal in this area. Uh, in other words, we've had many pregnant women uh, infected with the virus, and there are not any of the obvious, very severe problems, uh, I, sh I shouldn't say not any, there's not a large number of the obvious severe problems uh, uh, like there were for Zika. So we're not having hundreds of children born damaged. Um, whether there are more subtle uh, problems is you, you, we would not yet know, but there are studies looking at this. We, when the, the committee I was chairing and co-chairing did fund, have funded work in this area. So there are registries looking at at children born during this time period, including some work led from a colleague of mine here at the University of Liverpool, uh, Professor Louise Kenny, who is an interest in this area. So it's not, it may have been over, your, your committee may have overlooked it, but it's not been overlooked completely by the scientific community. And we are looking- But, but uh, the reports that have been published 
does not suggest a safe degree or any degree of vertical transmission at any stage. I think there are a few reports that suggest something, I, I, but there always are. You know, if you've got yeah. uh, yeah. 300,000 people in the UK yeah. known to be infected with the virus, there's always going to be a small signal. But I don't think there's a dramatic signal that suggests this is a major issue at the moment. I, I, Professor Bernard? Um, so, yeah, I have been also very interested in finding um, uh, post-mortem material of uh, uh, children. So I have liaised with my colleague at Great Ormond Street Hospital, a pediatric uh, neuropathologist. And uh, what we agree, there's a very small number of um, uh, children that have died. There is no child, to my knowledge, that died of COVID-related um, uh, complications. But um, to my knowledge, there is very limited material um, uh, available. And I can't really comment further what might be in, in realistically available for further studies. Okay, thank you very much, Lord Winston. Of course, one of, one of the issues also, which doesn't really, is not included in this half of the session is of course, what happens with the care of women who have their respiration and cardiac function in a very different position uh, during during late pregnancy, so we can't really ask you those questions, but um, it it would I think be useful perhaps just to consider that uh, a large number of viruses don't kill the don't kill the fetus, but they certainly may result in abnormalities in the fetus, which are not always uh, described or noticed till later on, and I think that is something which really uh, can I dare say, I mean obviously I know I'm not supposed to give an opinion here, but it would be helpful to hear from from you and perhaps from Professor O'Donoghue whether you feel that this is an important area for us to make sure is being followed up in public health. So I do think it's an important area and I can uh, seek the views from the obstetric uh, physicians who would have uh, you know more more and more handle on that. Well, uh, there are two on the two on the committee. Anyway, carry on. Professor O'Donoghue. No, sorry, I say I don't have I don't have expertise in that area myself, and I'm not cited on the details. So I think it's better that I send send information through to the committee. No, but, rather but, than speculate. But, but I think the question Lord Winston was asking: Do you agree that we should, in whatever we say in our report, should include as part of a long term data that should be collected should relate? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much indeed. That that really, I think, covers my question. Okay, uh, Baroness Young. Um, the questions I was going to ask have pretty well been answered, but but they do raise okay. another question, which is if um, if we're predicting a, a as yet unsized uplift in long term morbidity, ranging from fatigue right up to serious kidney and other damage. Is anybody out there, are you aware of anybody out there who's actually planning for dealing with this in the way that you described, i.e. in a multi-morbidity integrated way, which includes um, physical and mental health? Is, is the NHS planning to cope with this or is it being dealt with piecemeal at a local level? So I think it'd be fair to say that people are just uh, uh, getting by with the second wave, perhaps starting and trying to uh, maintain the services that have been brought back and, 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 and manage a workforce that has been f fairly, fairly battered uh, with, with things. So it's not there. I think there is some very good research that is that is being put in place. And we heard a little bit about that yeah, in, in the last uh, um, session. But it's excluded some data sets. So the kidney, you know, it's not linked to the renal registry. And, and, and you know, there's a great opportunity to link our data sets, which will tell us things that we can then model for and plan for. And I think that is something that so, you know so, we so. very much should do. This the service model, I think, is something that needs to be, be be challenged. And I think the only realistic way that we can put in a service model to, to monitor uh, and support people. Uh, is one that is actually holistic, because otherwise we've got, you know, so, three or four people involved in each individual's care. So, Professor Donnelly, as an officer of a professional organisation, do you think the professional organisation should get together to thrash out what kind of services will be required for people who have been infected with COVID-19 and the problems they will suffer in the long term? 
Yes. So that might happen soon. I, I, I hope it will. I think we are working in that direction, but uh, anything that can be done to support that, I think can be helpful. Okay. I have uh, Baroness Blackwood and Baroness Manningham Buller for a quick question. Baroness Blackwood. Thank you, Lord Chair. I actually wanted to follow up on the question uh, from Baroness Manningham Buller earlier about um, research gaps. And I did wonder if the witnesses knew if there were any plans or thought there was any value in comparing um, the long COVID cohort, which is emerging with other post-viral and chronic fatigue syndrome cohorts, and if there were data sets that were relevant, and if this would be valuable in understanding um, how to go forward. I think that's a really interesting uh, and useful comment. Um, I mean, we're in a sort of emerging area about this long COVID cohort, and there are some people who uh, feel very strongly they don't want to be grouped with this idea that this is a post-viral fatigue syndrome or chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, so, uh, I, but I, th I think com comparing patients can always be helpful and, and it can help guide services therefore accordingly. Baroness okay. Manningham Buller. Thank you, thank you, Lucha. I, I wanted to, one, and it may be that our witnesses can't answer this question, but I really wanted to follow up um, one can you, other can, question. Can you, come slightly, that, can you come slightly nearer uh, to your computer? It may be that uh, our witnesses can't answer this question, but I'd like to follow up something that Lord Ridley asked, which is really, um, whether we yet have any data on suicides or in hospital admissions for those who actually haven't had the disease, as far as they know, who are deeply affected by it mentally. Professor Solomon. Well, um, my, my, uh, I, my understanding is that looking at such data, particularly hospital admissions, is, is not it's difficult to make you know understand quite what that means because hospital admissions across the board were reduced at the start of the pandemic um and then uh you know and, and so i think just looking at hospital admissions is not necessarily going to give you an answer um i think there's there are data now there's quite a bit of data now showing uh covid19 is associated with increased anxiety and depression etc and and i think there are some data on on uh, an elevated suicide risk, but I'm not, I, I'm not completely sure of those. And um, Lord Winston was talking about perhaps gaps in the, in the remit of, of, of this group so far. And um, I don't know if you do plan to have somebody uh, with real expertise in mental health talking to you. Yeah, we have, we have sessions next week on mental health. You do, good, yeah. yeah. Okay, Baroness Manningham Buller, do you have any others? No? So that, that was the main one I, I was interested in, really the people who didn't have COVID and the effect of them. But I think they were here say, Lord Chair, we'll come to that next week. Okay. Thank you very much. I got only uh, two minutes left. So if I could ask a very quick question and a quick answer, it seems to me from the discussions we've had that there are considerable gaps in the research and particularly data collected, data collection that will be required for follow up and, and research into the follow-ups and service gaps for patients who might have, who have suffered from COVID-19 and survived, but will still continue to suffer because of organ damage. Would that do? Th would that be a good summary of it? So it would be a good summary, but it misses out the missed opportunity to link the data sets that we do have and and to address the IG issues that will that 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 that, that could allow that. So I think we've yeah. got the great data, but it, some of it is still in silos. But we have we have key issues in terms of you know the systematic follow up of 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 people. Okay. And I would like to add that uh, the, 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 the final outcome of uh, a small number of um, uh, people with uh, neurological complications uh, is obviously that they die of these conditions. And it would be very useful to encourage um, everyone involved in the uh, consenting and requesting postmortem procedures to uh, ensure that uh, um, uh, we get uh, material to investigate. Without a postmortem material to investigate um, 
the, uh, uh, the, the effects of COVID-19 on the brain, it will be much more difficult to link definite postmortem data with all the clinical data. Okay, thank you. Professor Solomon, do you have any yep. comments? I, I think I, I think you've summed it up very nicely. Um, I think uh, there are service gaps. I think this does present an opportunity, though, to think about how we might do service differently. And these these clinics where we have multiple input, we're not necessarily talking about six different consultants sitting together. I don't think that's ever going to happen. But I think what we're talking about is using the opportunity if a patient comes because of a renal problem, that may be the opportunity to provide extra input on their breathing and how they're coping with that. Are they coping with fatigue and stress? Are there other issues? So it's joining the, the services up in that kind of way. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, the Professor Bradner, the question that Lord Kekar had asked in the last group uh, was about whether enough tissue material is collected from patients uh, who mostly presumably really die from different organs to be able to have that tissue material to do studies in the future, including for medical for treatment development? Um, I think there was indeed a very significant effort on many sides, and there are uh, some amazing tissue collections. But I think given the scale of the problem and the scale of uh, the, the disease and its variety, to capture the more rare events and study them properly, um, I think more could be done uh, to, to close those gaps. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, all three of you, for helping us today. It's been a very interesting session. They all have been interesting. But thank you indeed very much. If you have any further material that you think might be benefit for us, please do feel, uh, feel free to send it. Professor O'Donnell, you, you did say that you'll be sending in something that the Royal College of Physicians has produced. Yep. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, all three of you, very much. Lord Chairman, can I just ask whether that's, is that an Olympic torch in the background of Professor? The proceed